Okay, hi there. So this is video three of gene expression and it is translation. So the final step. So you should have already watched section one on gene expression and RNA and section two on transcription and splicing. So this is finishing off with translation. Okay, so translation, this is when you're actually reading the code. So transcription, that copying the code, translation is reading it. Just like you translate something if you were in Spanish class. You would take it, you would read what is there, and you would translate it into something that actually makes sense. So that's what translation is about. So this process occurs in the ribosome, which is kind of what you already know from National 5. We're just putting a name to it now. And this is when the mRNA code is read. So those bases on the mRNA code are read by the ribosome. And that is used to put together the protein that we're wanting from that gene. So the protein itself, its shape and its function depends on the order of the amino acid that it's made of. And obviously the thing that tells the ribosome the correct order of amino acids is the mRNA, which is taking that code from the gene. So the gene has that code for the order of amino acids. The mRNA, mRNA transcribes it and copies it. It takes it to the ribosome and then the ribosome reads that order and says, right, I need this amino acid, then this one, then this one, then this one to make the correct protein that the gene desired. OK, so let's have a look at that process. So here is step one with my marvelous paint drawings. Uh, the brown thing is the ribosome. The purple thing is mRNA coming in, having been freshly spliced. Um, so the idea is the mRNA is going to enter the ribosome, come into it. Sometimes the ribosome is represented like this. It looks kind of like the buns of a hamburger. Uh, other times it might look like um, more like a hula hoop, the way that the mRNA just comes in through a tunnel. And the idea is the mRNA is going to be read in groups of three nucleotides. Now, those groups of three, you must know this term that's called a codon. OK, so what's going to happen is the ribosome is going to look and go, right, I'm starting with uh, reading it the wrong way around, but I'm going to I'm starting with an AUC, uh, which is me reading a codon there. OK, so we're thinking groups of three nucleotides, so three bases. Try not to refer to them as bases if you can. This is why it's called three nucleotides. So we've got AUC is what's being read as the first codon. Okay, so the next thing that happens is when this thing called tRNA comes in. So molecules of tRNA, which you can see in the diagram here, are the little red and yellow things which are labelled. You can see they've got an amino acid at the top, which is represented by different shapes. Uh, and at the bottom, they have three more nucleotides. And this is called an anticodon. So each section of TN, tRNA has an anticodon of some sort. And this anticodon is basically specific to the amino acid that it carries. So GAU will carry an amino acid. CGC will carry another one. AUU will carry another one. So it's very specific, like all of DNA, is these anticodons refer specifically to an amino acid. Uh, and what's important to know, again, the amino acid you'll see in all of these diagrams, the amino acid is a shape at the top of the tRNA. The anticodon is always at the bottom of it, and that's going to come in and interact with the mRNA. Something that's worth noting, uh, tRNA, it might appear looking like this on diagrams, but it, it's a single stranded molecule of what looks like mRNA, basically bases strung together. And it's sometimes formed in a kind of T shape where it's folded on top of itself. Uh, but the idea is at the bottom of it, you will have, as Miss Armstrong said, those three bases of an anticodon. If you're having trouble remembering, I remember anticodon has the T in it. So tRNA and T codon. OK. So oh, there we go. <laughs> You. Predicting myself there. OK, so the anticodons on the tRNA are complementary to the codons on the mRNA. If you have a look on how they're lining up in the diagram, they are lining up with the complementary relationship. Remembering that rule that RNA doesn't matter, tRNA, mRNA or rRNA does not contain any thymine. Instead, it has a uracil that does exactly the same job. Pairs with adenine, you'll find it opposite adenine. OK, so we've got everything lining up in a complementary way and we're starting to see the beginnings of a little peptide chain growing, because if you look at the top, the star, the green star, the orange star type thing and the purple pentagon, those are amino acids that are starting to line up next to each other. And if we think about what we know about proteins, they are chains of amino acids. So we're starting to get this idea that the tRNA is helping to choose the order of amino acids based off the mRNA, which is based off the DNA. Okay, so 
as these amino acids line up, like Miss Mills has just described, the next thing that happens is something called a peptide bond forms between the amino acids. And this is when we're getting closer to being a protein. So at this point, each amino acid, once it's in place, a peptide bond forms beside it. And this creates something called a peptide chain, which is virtually a protein. There's just one more wee step before we actually call it a protein. But as soon as you've got a chain of amino acids that have just been produced by tRNA, that peptide bond forms, they form a peptide chain. Okay. Now, there's a question about ribosomes. Ribosomes are constantly getting mRNA fed in, fed in, fed in. How does the ribosome know when to start making protein and when to stop? Between one mRNA and another, how can it tell the difference? The answer is actually in the mRNA sequence. Built in is a thing called a start codon. And what that does is it says, I'm start codon, I'm ready to go. You can go and start making a new protein. It's uh, normally an amino acid called methionine that's at the start of it. Um, and that's usually a signal that begin a new protein. The stop codon at the end is a signal to say end, stop, finished. Now, stop codons are very important because they're going to come in when we look at mutation, because basically we can look at what would happen if, say, ACG is our signal to say stop making a protein. What if that signal was accidentally coming in a little bit earlier? So what if you had a, se a sequence that was ACC, but then the cytosine accidentally changed to a guanine? So you end up with ACG and suddenly the protein stopped mating, making and that would end the protein. So it's an important thing to know about start codons at the start of the mRNA chain and stop codons tell the protein to stop building. Okay. So uh, another thing that's important to note is the idea that one gene can be responsible for producing many different proteins. And the thing that actually causes this is something known as alternative splicing. Now, Miss Mills talked through what splicing was in the last video, all talking about introns and exons and what happens with them to make that mature RNA transcript. So alternative splicing basically means that different introns are being cut out of that same original primary mRNA transcript. So different introns are cut out, which means that the different exons will be left in and it will code for different amino acids. And as soon as you've got different amino acids, you've got a different protein, which is something you should hopefully remember from National 5. So one gene can be made, can make many, many proteins. It just depends on the way the splicing occurs. There's a lovely diagram in the Sway actually showing this. It's not on this PowerPoint, but check back at the Sway because it does make that point really clear. One single gene different introns and exons cut and you end up with like three different proteins being made because of different cuts that are made. Okay now we've got a peptide chain okay so at the end of translation a peptide chain a single chain of amino acids a protein is a three-dimensional shape with a specific function think about enzymes enzymes are specific shapes we've got the active site area they are they are um, you know a three-dimensional structure they're not just a line of amino acids so to turn the peptide chain into a protein, it has to be folded and it has to be shaped. Now, here are these bonds come again. So you've got hydrogen bonds and other forces. Uh, so things like for chemists, Van der Waals forces, they start to interact between the bases um, in order to cause folded areas and hold the shape of the protein uh, together. So typically, basically two bond answers here is or sorry, three bond answers. You've got sugar phosphate bonds from DNA structure, hydrogen bonds from DNA structure and here and uh, peptide bonds between amino acids. So those are three quite important bonds to be aware of and their function. Okay, yeah, and this diagram again, this just shows what Mills, Mills has just said. It's also on this way. So you've got your amino acids. They start to form those peptide bonds between them, which causes it to become a peptide chain. And then these other bonds, these hydrogen bonds, form between different sections of the peptide bond to form a protein. So this is it going from peptide and then it is being shaped and folded to form the protein that we are ultimately wanting. OK, so to summarise translation, OK, so just that process, the ribosome is the location of translation. And remember, ribosomes are in the cytoplasm, so that's where it's going to happen. Yeah, the codon is that area of three nucleotides that is on the mRNA. And then the anticodon is the area of three nucleotides on the tRNA. Okay, tRNA is the thing that carries the specific amino acids to the ribosome. Okay, and then amino acids are joined together using peptide bonds to form a peptide chain and then eventually a protein. 
So that's it for the gene expression key area. You've got your PLP to work through, you've got your Kahoot to do, um, and then the homework and the past papers will be released at some point. As always, any questions, uh, email me still at the moment. Um, your other teaching arrangements which hopefully could be coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, please uh, don't email me. Yeah, she doesn't work here anymore, despite appearances. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, good luck. Any questions, email me.